Welcome to Bridging Voices, the video podcast series of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation's Multinational Development Policy Dialogue Program here in Brussels. My name is Widya Puspitasari. I'm a PhD researcher at Europa Universität Flensburg in Germany. I focus on EU policymaking process and I'm currently interning at the CAS MDPD office here in Brussels. Today I'm also joined with three other wonderful young speakers with whom we will be discussing about issues related to youth involvement and representation on EU politics and the upcoming European election 2024. First, as a first speaker, we have here Ismail Paez Civico. He is currently serving as the board member of the European Youth Forum. He's a podcaster, author, and executive coordinator at the Confederation of European Senior Expert Services. Very welcome to you, and we're very happy that you accepted our invitation to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope uh, I can give you a bit more of insight for what young people think around voting and European elections and uh, well in general policy dialogues, let's put it that way for lack of a better term. We're also joined by two other interns at the CAS MDPD office here. Charlotte Walter, she is an undergraduate of political science and law in Munich, Germany. And also Clara Burkhardt, an undergraduate at of international affairs in Brussels. Welcome you both. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. Happy to be here. Perhaps I'd start with a little icebreaker uh, by asking Ismail, maybe you could introduce yourself and the work that you do in the European Youth uh, Forum to our listeners. Sure. So to start first, uh, we are around 10 board members in European Youth Forum. Uh, six board members, uh, eight bo eight, six, seven board members, sorry, two vice presidents, one president. Uh, we are all volunteers. Personally, we all have our own portfolios. So, uh, of course, every person we work on specific portfolios um, with people from our secretariat. So we have our governing, our board, which is uh, the board members, president and vice president, and then we have the secretariat. Me personally, my main portfolios are digitalization, civic space, um, and funding. So those are the main three issues I work with. Uh, I'm also Brussels-based, so that helps <laughs> a, a, a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, apart from that, it's quite wide, and then, of course, we're always there to represent Youth Forum uh, wherever needed, and different activities, different events, projects, etc. And um, yeah, that's pretty much my, my work. Uh, we have a mandate of uh, this year, year and a half. Uh, it's usually two years, but we had to cut it short for, for internal reasons. In the European Youth Forum, there are around, because we have also around 112, I believe, full members. Um, so the European Youth Forum is mainly composed of national youth councils and international non-governmental youth organizations. So national youth councils are the ones representing young people um, at a national level. And of course, they they themselves have their own platforms on regional levels of youth councils of young people. And then we have the international non-governmental youth organizations, with our, which are international platforms um, with different goals, let's say, uh, and, and different uh, work that they do. So it's a quite a huge uh, yeah. forum of youth organization. Well, let me start the discussion on the topic of youth and their involvement on the European election. If we look at the data on the last election, 2019, we have over 50% of European citizens voting in the European elections with large increase in youth participation. However, despite the increase in youth participation, and higher voter turnout, less than half of the young population voted in this election, which quite is a reflection of the absence of youth uh, from the EU institutional politics. Um, the data from the European Parliament also mentioned that young Europeans today participate less than the other age group and also less than the other cohorts of young people decades ago. I want to get to you, Ismail. What would you say the reason for this? Why do you think there is a lack of youth participation in the election process, despite considerable amount of uh, young people joining the political activism? Like We observe a lot of uh, participation in movements such as Fridays for Futures, for instance. Well, it is true that, on one hand, there is a bit more of, quote-unquote, I'm very careful using these quotes, uh, of political participation of people around Europe, but uh, through a Eurobarometer survey, the main reason why young people did not vote, at least by 60% of those that didn't, was that it was mainly for practical reasons. Let's say that there are quite a lot of, a few barriers, let's say, logistical barriers mainly, that impede young people from voting. So it's not as much as they're not interested in politics, um, per se, 
in a, in a, in a very wide manner when you can go from voting or political activism or even volunteering or whatever your way of, uh, of youth participation is, it's mainly because of practical and logistical reasons. And those are things that we are bringing up um, as much as we can to say we need to facilitate the voting process for all the population, of course, but our main concern is young people so they can actually have um, the, the, well, the right to vote or use that right, let's say, and make the most of it. Could you perhaps concretely explain what these uh, logistical barriers are with regards to the European election and the young people? Well, the easiest one I can say, when you right now when you turn 18, but although we do advocate for a voting age at 16, so that's a different conversation, but it's the same, um, it's the same issue. When you, when you turn 16 and you turn 18, some countries you can already vote at 16, um, you have all these, let's say, new rights that you acquire for becoming an adult. And everything that comes with it, it's super complicated and there's not an actual like starter pack, if for lack of a better term to call it, uh, on how to engage in all of these things. So it's mainly lack of knowledge or lack of will from, from the politicians, let's say, or, or the governments or the institutions to give all the tools for young people. So I believe that they will need like a kind of starter pack to say, okay, how you can vote, where do you need to go to register, um, what are the different processes. And also we believe that digitalizing the whole voting process there's some of the issues att attached to that, but the main reason is so it can be more accessible, uh, especially when you're, for example, if you're in a rural area and you don't really have access to a voting poll uh, near you or you have to move to quite some place. And uh, there, are, there, there are ways of, um, of working around this, but um, I think that's the best example that I can give, just lack of accessibility and, and lack of knowledge and lack of will, let's say, to provide that knowledge to the people that actually just acquired the right to vote. You already explained about the lack of knowledge and also accessibility. What do you think about loss of confidence of the youth or European youths to the EU in general? Does that also contribute to the lack of youth participation in elections? It's a question around dissonance in political discourse between young people mm -hmm. and, and, and what happens in politics. Um, yes, yes, quite a bit, I do believe also. Um, so, like we said again, we are the biggest platform of youth organizations in the world, we're the platform of platforms. And we give everything that we do is based on what the membership tells us, right? So we have our internal governing processes. So everything that, that we come up with, that we say, we don't just bring out here because we're in a secretariat in Brussels and, and we think, no, no, we have our statutory meetings, we have our, um, our working groups, we have our task forces. So all of this information com comes essentially from grassroots level young people that tells us that these are the issues. And around that question, it's mainly because politicians, let's say, or the high levels, don't really listen to what young people actually want to see from them. So when they've been demanding the same thing year and year and over and over again, and they don't see any change, I can give a few examples maybe when it comes to climate change, for instance, um, they just completely disconnect, let's say, completely from the political discourse, and they find their own political processes. We have our um, internal process, actually, with institutions, for instance, the youth dialogue, and that is one of a very good it's a tool, platform, program, whatever you want to call it, a series of conferences and, uh, and activities that national youth councils undertake um, and international non-governmental youth organizations also, although it's, it's a smaller delegation um, around Europe to actually do implement and give policy recommendations to decision makers from EU institutions to see what, to what they want to see. So maybe a bit more of connection between the process that we have with civil society, with international non-governmental youth organizations and the actions that leaders and politicians must take um, in order to apply what we've actually been demanding for, for so many years. And again, we have documents and documents, so we, we give a lot out, actually, a lot of information on things that politicians can do. Some listen, some don't. Uh, we'd hope to have a larger conversation around with, with everyone, really, with, with as many people as are actually willing to implement all of this, and that's why the elections next year are very, very important. Um, so that's pretty much it. We, we already have our work. We, we have conferences, we have our dialogues, we have our task forces, we have our policy dialogues essentially, we engage with policy dialogues all throughout last year with every single EU commissioner, so, so they are aware of the information, just that they need to apply it, and if they apply it, if they open themselves a bit more to conversations with young people and with our youth organisations and our platform, I really do believe uh, there will be a little bit more trust or building the trust. Trust is very easily lost and very, uh, let's say, it's, it's very difficult to get, to get it back, and I think that's, that's what's been happening with young people. It's not like they're less active, but they are more disconnected from, from political discourse. So it's important to maintain this political yeah. trust. And yeah. you already mentioned about the concrete uh, actions that is done by the European Youth Forum uh, with the political youth dialogues and so on, but it's only a matter of 
um, than the political will from the top. But before we get back to that, uh, I want to ask Charlotte, how do you think we can better engage the young people? Uh, maybe you can speak from your experience and increase their active uh, participation with regards to the election. Well, I think as Ismail already mentioned, it is first of all a process of identifying problems specifically so that they can then be further addressed. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think what is most important amongst young people, which is probably not true for my peers and my fields of studies because I do study political science and many people are very aware of their opportunities in that field, um, but talking about the general youth, especially in Germany, the ones that I know, for example, from school, I would say that there's a general lack of knowledge and understanding about um, the functionings of the European Union, especially if people are not they're interested in politics themselves. It is very hard to transfer that knowledge. Like Speaking from my experience, I only started learning about this stuff in 10th grade in school. I believe, and even then it was very, very limited. It was to a very limited level and mixed with a lot of other topics in the same class that tackled political and social issues on a very broad level. And I think that is not enough to really understand European politics, to understand the functioning of the European institutions and the importance of European elections. And this goes hand in hand with this lack of trust in European politics that has been mentioned. Because essentially, if young people are not aware of how their votes and their voices contribute to the processes in the European Union, they also do tend to have to not have enough or sufficient trust in the European processes and in European politics. And therefore, I believe it's very, very important to promote political education and to invest in that field in order to promote education, to promote knowledge about politics. Because only if young people can answer the question, how does my vote contribute to the success of European politics, to discussing certain issues that are important to me, only then they will really know why it is important to vote. And furthermore, if people are not aware yet or have not been able to obtain that knowledge in school, for example, during the process of their education, there are a lot of means today that can transfer that knowledge. For example, if you speak about media, um, specifically for young people, I believe social media is a very important tool. But even the range of those tools are limited, as for example, social media mostly provides short news flashes. It provides summaries, bulletins, but it hardly provides deeper deeper analysis or deeper, deeper reflections about politics. And therefore, I think it is important to invest in different sources of information, to provide information on many different levels in order to make it easier for young people to understand European politics. You mentioned a little bit about social media, and I want to ask you, Clara, with regards to the importance of social media to increase the interest of the youths with the political process. Um, so first of all, also being from Germany, I agree with everything that Charlotte has just mentioned. There is a lack of political education on every level. Um, and on social media, it does serve as a very useful tool. Generally, web-based applications, anything, online platforms could be a very, very useful tool to engage a lot of people. On social media, I feel there is not enough credible and in-depth information and analysis on what's happening on European politics. And there's also a lot of mis- and disinformation, of course. And you need to make sure that there is more fact-finding, that there are <laughs> that there are official channels to which people can access um, unbiased and credible information on what's happening in European politics and European election. And this is holds also true for... Um, mainstream public media so television radio i we talked about this earlier that um in germany what's mostly covered in the public media is national politics european politics is not covered to that extent and not that frequently and especially the european elections are also not covered that frequently and i think if you would change that if you would give a better um yeah if you would provide more information, evidence, information to young people, that would help them um, get engaged in, for example, in voting for the European elections or maybe also furthering their interests in participating in the process. I actually wanted to add on the perspective on social media because I've 
I'm coming from Southeast Asia, specifically Indonesia, and I have seen how significant social media has been in terms of mobilizing political interests. And we can observe this in the last election of Thailand, for instance, where it was due to the youth uh, using a lot of social media platforms, mobilizing uh, young people or their peers' uh, political interest and really utilizing these platforms to engage and maintain that type of engagement. And I think this is something that we can explore further as uh, young people. But let's get back to the uh, topic of political trust and interest that you all have mentioned. I want to get back to you, uh, Ismail. What do you think uh, the European institutions could do to concretely increase this political trust and interest for the young people at the European level, because we only see more at the national level rather than the European level? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, because that's also something we're working on, actually. Um, we have something we worked on that's called the youth test. So ideally what it is, is a, but it's simple, is a screening process of every single piece of legislation or directive or recommendation coming from the EU institutions. And the idea behind that is that it gets screened to see uh, the sustainability of that and how um, is it sustainable for young people, first of all, and is it youth-centred? So are, are young people also involved in that set of legislation? Are the views um, being taken into account? Is the legis- are we going to have to change that legislation in the next five years, ten years, and then be unsustainable for the future generations of young people? Um, so I think that is something that, if that does get implemented, I do believe young people will start seeing that the institutions are actually listening. We are a big chunk of the demographic at the end of the day. Um, most, well, all policies must actually be tailored also with young people at its core because we're young today, but then tomorrow there'll be other set of young people, another set of young people, another set of young people, and the demographic will still be big um, of, of that of that representation of society. So I think that our, our youth test that we're developing, of course, we have a lot more on it on our website, uh, youthfrom.org, so that, that there's a lot more information on there. But I do believe the youth test could be a good start, at least, uh, to gain that trust back with, uh, with the youth. Oh, sorry, with the uh, youth organizations and National Youth Council and young people in a, in a more general manner. Thank you for informing that. I really did not, uh, I was not aware of this uh, youth test. I don't know about the two of you, but yeah, interesting to know. But uh, now we have come to the second part of our discussion. I wanted to bring our discussion more to the topic of underrepresentation of the youth in EU decision making process. Previously, we have touched about the election process. Now, I wanted to look at actual representation of the young people within the decision-making process of the EU, how they can actually influence the legislation process. And according to the 2022 studies, young people are actually the most underrepresented age group in the European Parliament. Currently, the average age of MEPs is 49 years. The results of this analysis show that only 6% of the elected MEPs were under 35. So there's a disparity between this number of the elected representatives and the actual share of the approximately 20% of the European population under 35. Disparity, of course, implies that there is a gap in the descriptive representation with the critical policy implications. I wanted to ask you, Ismail, why do you think youth is still underrepresented in the institution, despite significantly having increased participation uh, in the election in 2019? Well, we're talking about, if it comes to political representation and, uh, and decision-making places, like it might be the European Parliament, for instance, um, it's actually quite funny because there are only six MEPs under the age of 30 in the European Parliament, and uh, there are more people called Martin in the European Parliament that people aged so they can see how many few people there are um, and, and this comes back to actually to, to the thing I said before is when we if we actually commit to lowering the voting age of 16 young people will get engaged from a lot earlier so give them like a, a buffer let's say to get more engaged in politics and get better prepared let's say better suited to really get um, into at decision making levels, which is on local, on local level, regional, national, even international, uh, what well, sorry, uh, European Union uh, level, EU level. So it's mainly because of that. It's mainly because the life is starting a bit later now. People aren't getting as politically active um, as when they should, which is actually around 16. Um, so 
Yeah, I do believe that if we lower, let's say, the age of 16, maybe we'll get more under 30 young leaders, uh, young politicians in EU institutions. Um, and that, yeah, that, that's one of the best uh, answers I can give, really. Yeah, I can only also relate to the Malaysian experience because they had they had this campaign to lower the also the voting age from I think twenty one to seventeen, and that's also of course the argument for that is of course when people start earlier they don't already you know get into their job this lifestyle that they don't care anymore about politics and life hits and so on so. Of course, this uh, lowering of age for voting is very important. I want to get to you, Clara. What do you feel as the effects of this underrepresentation uh, in the decision-making process as European youth? Um, so I believe to um, about lowering the voting age. I do think it would be impactful, but I think a lot starts also with the whole framework of political parties and for instance when we come to European elections parties being willing to put young candidates on their lists um, I think there is a big internal problem in political parties um, in wanting to uh, young people to exceed because there are a lot of biases and towards um, maybe the experience or the competence of young people that's uh, at least the feeling that I got so they are vastly underrepresented in parties but maybe also don't have the same career um, opportunities than people with more experience or who are uh, older and it's so important that young people are represented in the decision making process because the policy areas that concern young people are those that are going to affect their lives in the long term right so we see that youth and we mentioned this a couple of times now in the podcast that youth is very active in political activism but it's not um, incorporated into the political decision-making process to the same extent. And, um, I mean, policy areas that concern youth are a lot like social um, issues or um, the climate crisis. Um, a lot of relevant things that would contribute to improving society. And, um, yeah, I, I really think that the lack of representation at the European level is probably also a big reason why youth feels frustrated or the youth feels frustrated to you know you have the feeling that if you're going to vote what's my vote going to change what impact am i going to have in mm, in the actually policy making process if there if my age group is not represented at the decision making level young people often lose trust in the fact that their policy interests are actually going to be represented Lara mentioned about the lack of engagement of the political parties to the young people. Would you say this is also observed by the youth organizations? And has there been something done to actually tackle that issue? To include young people uh, in political parties, you mean? Or yes. To what extent? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's good to ask that question because I want to come back to what she was saying. Um, I'm half Spanish, half English. So those political systems are quite different to when it comes to it. But... We can speak about all the systemic barriers and the logistical issues and why, well, young people can't access either voting and the and all this, that's fine. But one of the biggest issues is also culturally speaking. Um, when you have, for instance, closed list in some countries, um, you, you, you usually get to the state where you can, uh, when you can represent the party in elections out of seniority. So it's usually, uh, for a, the more you are there, the more you climb up. It's not really based on meritocracy, on your ideas or what you're willing to do for the party or for the people you represent mainly uh, well, who do you know and for how long you've been there. So usually when you're young, you don't really get there. They're not going to put you on the list. You just have to wait, wait your turn, right? It's the, there's no actual will. So this can be remedi uh, remediated, actually. The parties need to be a little bit more, I don't know I say culturally open, but to the extent that wanting to engage young people because they can actually see the benefit from it. There are benefits in here. We're not just demanding things to say, okay, yeah, just include young people and you're not going to benefit from it. They actually will benefit from it. There will be young people who actually get more interested. And again, if we're speaking purely political strategy here, that's what makes sense. If you want to get people more involved, people more open to vote, involve young people in your list. They're going to feel more identified with that. You know, people will get more identified with what they know. And if they see a young person from a specific background and say, oh, okay, well, I feel identified with that person. Um, as for us, of course, I mean, all our platforms are youth-led. Uh, our, our board members are youth-led. We're all young people. Um, we're all coming from very, very different backgrounds. I personally from a society background, from a volunteering background, from an NGO background. 
So I'm, I don't come from a political background. Other young people from my board come from political backgrounds, more politically active platforms or organizations. Um, me, not so much, right? So, so, so we are a very diverse group of young people and we always involve each other. Uh, we always represent each other, let's say. So no, we don't, uh, we ourselves are the perfect representation of that and how we manage to work around that. Um, being young people, working for young people and being represented by young people. And, uh, and our platforms very well re represent that, I believe. So if you want to get good examples, any single one of our platforms, any single one of our member organizations, uh, National Youth Council, even the European Youth Forum itself is, is a great example on how we involve young people in our internal processes. Again, all of our recommendations, uh, papers, studies, campaigns, they're not just our ideas of the European Youth Forum per se, but they're ideas of the whole European Youth Forum. So all the members, all the National Youth Councils, and all of these are young people. So we do have our internal processes. Well, the concrete uh, action that has been done by the European institution is the Commission introducing this initiatives of legislative proposals known as the European Citizens Initiative. And uh, this gives possibility not just to European youths, but it could be used as a platform for them to engage with the legislative process. Do you think there is actually sufficient awareness uh, of this option among young people based on your experience, Charlotte? Well, I would say no, to be honest. I do not think that there is sufficient awareness among young people. I mean, when you look at the requirements for the ECI, essentially you need to collect one million signatories um, and you also, of course, need to organize it um, appro appropriately. But especially when you talk about youth movements, it is something that could be a very valuable opportunity for young people and for larger groups of young people that do have the same interests. We talked about policy domains that are important for young people today, which are, for example, climate change, among others. Um, but essentially, if you look at the numbers of the ECI so far, only nine um, initiatives reached the required number of signatories, whereas 100 were initiated since the introduction of the initiative uh, of the European Citizens um, Initiative in um, um, in the Lisbon Treaty. And essentially, that does show when you look at um, 400, approximately 450 million European citizens that there is no extensive use of this of this opportunity. Um, but essentially, as I said, for movements, for larger groups with that share common interests, it can be a very valuable and opportunity, and it has a high potential for young people to be able to directly introduce their ideas, introduce their priorities into European politics, and to make sure that, and it also is partially a way to make sure that their interests are being represented. And therefore, I believe that this issue should, or this opportunity should receive more awareness for sure. What about your experience, Clara, with you coming from Berlin and also studying in Brussels? Do you think there's actually volumes or noises around this uh, initiative? Because I personally find it very uh, amazing that the commission has this platform because I can only judge where I'm from, Indonesia, and th there's nothing like that. There's like an affirmative action coming from the institution giving the option and possibility for the young people or others uh, to create initiatives for being more involved in the legislative process. Um, I would say from my experience, both in Brussels and Berlin, um, there is no awareness on these initiatives. People don't know that this is an option. And it's crazy because, I mean, I read up a little bit on it. And, um, I mean, to start such an initiative, you need to um, have a committee. You need to find a committee um, with representatives from seven different member states in which the signatures have to be collected. And although that does seem maybe in first instance a bit complicated, it actually shouldn't be because most of the policy interests that young people have, they're of global or European concern. And then we talked about you have um, the, these digital platforms that youth is using extensively. So connecting one another, um, you should easily get to one million signatures. Um, so yeah, I think it's an awareness issue. Um, well, you already mentioned about the procedure, how we would need uh, seven different representation from different countries. You coming from, Ismail, coming from uh, this youth forums where you have higher, so to say, leverage than to 
mobilize uh, people that then could utilize this platform of citizen initiative from the commission to get more involved. What do you think has been the challenges uh, to utilize this initiative? I want to get back uh, on what Clara said because she's, she's completely right. I mean, I'm going to give credit where credit's due at some point. I'm not just going to always criticize the European Commission and the EU institutions. They have done quite a bit comparison when you compare to lots of areas around the world to engage in people. There's another initiative by the, I think, comms of the European Commission. Um, it was Youth Voices. Don't take my word for it. I've I forgot the exact name of it, but uh, it's where you can send uh, voice notes to, to commissioners, essentially, of, uh, so you know, people can, um, can engage in that. There was uh, the policy dialogues done last year. That was a follow-up on, um, on the Conference on the Future of Europe, right? So we met with every single EU commissioner. We took a delegation from, uh, well, the Youth Forum was there, lots of different, and even organizations not re uh, in the Youth Forum, even youth organizations not in the Youth Forum, it's not just Youth Forum representatives. Um, so we, we did have the chance to discuss with them. Um, I mean, there are initiatives out there, right? Of course, a lot more can be done. That's why we're here, to say what can be done more and then how can we, we increase that participation and young people getting involved politically. But um, when it comes to that, when it comes to communications and reaching out to the non-usual suspects at the grassroots local level, that's where it becomes complicated. We ourselves... We can say, yes, we represent young people. Why? Because we have our platform to prove that. So we have organizations in every single, well, most um, continental European countries, they themselves have their own organizations on a local level. Mm -hmm. So all that information comes from the local back to us. We, we have our processes to, to, to back that up. Of course, not every young person is going to know what, who the European, what the European Youth Forum is, but our, but our members do, do the due diligence and their work on a grassroots level enough for it to be able to claim that we represent young people. Um, so this is something we have been calling a lot towards the European Commission is how do we get all this information at a local level? How do we get young people to get informed, right? It's mainly just information. I come from a very small town in Spain. That's where I grew up. 5,000 people in my hometown in Spain. And they have no idea what's going on, like nothing. Like even me, <laughs> every time I go back, they, they, they think I'm, I'm like I'm an MEP or something. They have no idea what happens in, the, uh, in Brussels, which I'm not, <laughs> 100%. But anyway, uh, so they have no idea what's going on. They have no idea about the different uh, initiatives, even when it just comes to volunteering. I have every two days easily someone from my hometown because they know, oh, yeah, contact Ismail, just for things as simple as where can I go to volunteer? I, 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 I want to do a volunteering project. Where, where can I go? I say, okay, well, I need to send uh, X amount of links and X amount of projects. You can get involved in this and that and that. Um, so communication is a big issue. And again, through digitalizing, let's say, the communication channels and where to get involving more national, regional, and local authorities and all of this. I think local authorities have a big role to play, so they also need to get a little bit more interested in how they can reach out to the to their young constituents, let's say, in their local areas. We can't do everything from here. Uh, Europe is so vast, some places we, we can't reach out to by purely logistical reasons, um, but local political representatives do have a role to play and they have an obligation to also get their youth more involved and uh, they themselves pr are proportioning that information. So, so I think that's also important to say. It, it's not all for us, youth platforms, youth organizations do all the work and reach out to young people. Local, regional, and national, let's say, uh, politicians, again, decentralizing that, 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 that hub of information to the local level, all the way to the local level, that it will really will facilitate young people to get engaged. Like er er Erasmus Plus projects, lots of people in my hometown got engaged because there was someone local there informing young people how to get involved in Erasmus Plus projects. Political, same thing. You need to go back to the local. There's no point of centralizing all the information in Brussels. It has to be decentralized to every single local authority around Brussels. Oh, sorry, around Brussels. Around Europe. And, of course, digitalization is the most important part, it, which you're also working on. Of course, yeah. I mean, it's a big tool uh, that, that can be used for good. But at the end of the day, I still do believe that one of the best things comes to peer-to-peer, face-to-face communications. Um, so... That's how most people get engaged, really, when it comes to volunteering or going abroad. Is that they heard from a friend, from a friend, from a friend. Initially speaking, of course, there can be a lot, lots of campaigns um, going around, and well, through the all awesome platforms we have now, social media um, and everything, there are a lot of opportunities to do that. It has to be better used, but then we know that, let's say, institutions, uh, governmental institutions, aren't the best at using social media and political platforms because then, of course, you have lots of hurdles you need to go through. You have political interests. You have platforms that are made from other countries and you cannot use. You have GDPR issues with... Anyway, so it's, it's not always easy. Uh, so that's maybe is for 
youth organizations, but again, local authorities most of the time have social media and, and they're a bit more free to say what they want to say. Uh, they're not as restri- uh, as restricted than EU institutions. So again, that's their role. They can do it. They can share information. They can reach out to young people. And, and they're the ones essentially that, that should be the pioneers in reaching out to these, um, we like to call them um, the non-usual suspects. So yeah. Okay, so we have discussed about the engagement down to the regional level with regards to reaching out to the young people. Uh, I still want to go back to the issue of underrepresentation in the EU policy making process. You mentioned already before about the systemic barriers that makes it more difficult for the young people to actually involve themselves in the political process, for instance, to run as candidates, uh, they face this uh, barriers of cost of campaigns, for instance, or the eligibility, eligibility rules of the candidate, of the selection processes. And in addition, there's also a lot of this negative perception of the involvement of the young people in politics due to, for instance, lack of sufficient experience or them just not being taken as serious. I can also say this about Indonesia, for instance, like the youths are more seen as a commodity, like political commodity, rather than regarded for their political aspirations. What do you think about the idea of youth quotas as an affirmative action addressing the issue of this uh, underrepresentation? Because there's a lot of buzz around uh, the idea of youth quotas in the polit- in politics. So first of all, what you said, we have the eligibility criteria. So it is complicated because when it comes to when we say vote the age down to sixteen, we also mean uh, young sixteen year olds being eligible for local, national, regional, even international elections, uh, EU elections, um, if they want. So it's not just being able to vote; it's also being able to represent and present yourself uh, politically. Uh, when it comes to culture, now we don't. <laughs> it's a complicated question about quotas. Um, we don't have a specific position around quotas. Now, that said, on a personal level, and then I'm speaking for myself, I'm not speaking in a name of anyone, um, I do believe it is complicated because then at the end, quotas does not resolve the issue of culture. Let's say the culture around taking young people seriously, that will not resolve it. Uh, some countries, that there is something to be claimed that when you implement them first, it takes like a buffer time, a margin of people to get used, and then it gets implemented into the culture. I've heard that argument quite a few times. When happened, I think, I believe in Bulgaria, when they uh, inserted quotas for women participation, and then it gave that buffer time indeed for the culture to be more used to getting women inside, and then when they took them off, actually women started getting more elected. So, so I think that there are two ways of, 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 of seeing things. Me personally, um, I'm not too keen on them, but again, um, I don't believe we as a youth forum have, um, have a specific position on that, so I will not be speaking again in the name of anyone, just myself in this case. Uh, but yes, it is, a, it is an interesting concept, um, maybe test it out, so there are some localities that have been testing out specific like political prototypes, uh, like the youth test, there are some localities that are actually implementing the youth test, there are some localities um, that are implementing uh, about 16 and all of this, so it can be tested out on a local level and then see how it works out, but then again, we need to be careful Something that works on a local level doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work on an EU level or national level. So there, there, there are lots of questions around that. I, I don't think we found the actual answer yet. Um, I just think that first, before we get to radical measures like that, I would like people to think more about how to culturally involve young people and take them seriously out of themselves and not them being forced to have to involve them. Um, because I don't think politics should be of, um, let's say, who has the strongest stick or who's more or who has more privileges around politics, I think we all should get the same sort of privilege, the same sort of access and activities. And the issue is that young people don't get that equal access. That's the problem here, that they don't have the same equality opportunity as the other demographics within politics. So that's the main issue here. It's not about let's be let's get our own space. No, we want to be in the same space as other demographics because we believe that we also have good ideas. There are very good young people, uh, competent young people out there. And we, we just did a campaign now on social media to say what we, we, we asked all our, all our membership, what do you do when you were 16, uh, to actually push towards voting 16 and political representation at 16. And they all came out with these amazing stories, like young people that did very good things when they were 16 years old. And that for me, he's as, or she is as uh, legitimate to represent people, not just young people, but people um, in politics as any other 35-year-old, 40, 50-year-old. Because when you hear the things that they've achieved, 
the, the competence that they have, they're just as uh, ready. This brings us to the last part of the, our discussion today. I will address this question to the three of you, but perhaps I will start with Clara. What do you think, we already discussed about the issue of underrepresentation. So what do you think could be done, both by the European institutions, but also by the young people to address this long-standing issue? Um, I would like to talk about increasing participation and representation. Um, so you talked about the Conference on the Future of Europe, for example. Um, just for the viewers that are maybe not up to date on that, that was a year-long, um, basically, plenary discussion, right? Um, Citizen-led, um, went from April 2021 to May 2022. And citizens came up with proposals to the European policymakers, right? And I feel a lot of also on how to reform the institutional framework of the EU. And then we have the proposal specifically 36 to 38, which deal with um, also youth participation and generally um, increasing participation of European citizens in European politics. And what was said, like important points were also this um, increasing political education through a redefinition of school curricula, for example, um, in building uh, digital platforms where information is collected and is concise and accessible, maybe also platforms that actively give the opportunity to participate in the maybe collecting of ideas for policymakers or other way around, um, then um, that there should be more news coverage on the political um, decision-making process in Brussels, but also on the elections, like doing the elections, the coverage of how's the voting going, what's going on, what is at stake, which policies are um, relevant for the next terms. These things should be more discussed and also in, an, in a credible and as impartial as possible, you know, in the, in the national media. And I also feel that you could invest, and this is what you are doing with the European Youth Forum, in capacity building of young people, put them in situations where they practice their skills to actively be a decision maker or be a policy maker. You have this a little bit... Um, you have, for example, this model European Parliament or model United Nations is a very specific type, but it's basically um, simulations of, um, of Parliament or of other governing bodies and you as a young person can go there and practice what it would be like to sit in the shoes of the policymakers. Of course, this is not enough because you should not just practice, but you should also be heard in in effect, so um, maybe youth parliaments could also be an idea with proposals directly influencing the policy making in the um, yeah, national European Parliament. And uh, yeah, for the underrepresentation, I think there is a lot to be done about the party culture, as you said. There are youth parliaments, actually. It depends on the countries that are already there. The problem is, again, uh, the connection between the youth parliament and the actual parliament. Yeah, so yeah. That's the issue there, really. But yeah, you're completely right. So, um, I mean... Would you like to add something with regards to this? Well, I think essentially what we have also seen through our discussion here today is that the reasons for underrepresentation and lack of participation are very, very complex and there's multiple of them. And essentially they need to be addressed at all levels. Like you, for example, mentioned that we cannot underestimate the importance of local level authorities, for example. And I believe that this is very important, that those issues, those problems are addressed at all levels, at local level, national and at the European level. And essentially, the problems are very complex. They start within parties, for example, with candidate selections, but also with awareness, with knowledge. And those are all issues that will have to be addressed in the future. And I think this is really a challenge, and there's quite a lot of them to overcome for young people. But I'm confident that we will be able to increase participation and reach proper representation for young people in the future. You already mentioned about the disconnection between the youth enthusiasm in political activities and also giving out their voice and the, 
this connection happens to the European institutions, which translates to less of outcomes that are being said by the European youths. What do you think could be then um, a solution for this uh, long term? And I would like to give you the final opportunity to say uh, something with regards to the underrepresentation issues. The underrepresentation issues is, first of all, facilitate all the logistics and accessibility, let's say, of young people when it comes to voter registration, how to vote, where to vote, give them the information. Um, and therefore given the tools to actually participate and, and give their vote. Lowering down the age of 16, making the voter outcome a lot bigger, getting engaged in politics earlier, so we have more political leaders under the age of 30 um, later on. And of course the EU youth test, to actually make policies sustainable, long-term, and also having young people in mind and, and centred, um, so young people don't get left behind. Mm, so yeah, in a, in a very, 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 uh, in a nutshell, I would say that would be my closing words. Uh, we have lots of initiatives, we have all papers, um, opinions, well not opinions mainly, but what youth form opinions, let's put it that way, um, and general recommendations, and we all have them on our website, and of course you know, at youthforum.org, so there's a lot of information on there of all of our campaigns, Vote 16, the youth taste, uh, banning unpaid internships, that's just, again, one of them, we have so many around them. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it, we work on, uh, on lots of different things, uh, a lot of variety. Thank you very much to all our distinguished speakers for today's discussion. I am actually not as a European, but I'm still very much excited to look forward of how the turnout would be for the upcoming election. And we hope this time we will have higher voting turnout and higher representation. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you.